Hello and welcome to No Rest for the Weekend, where we go behind the scenes and talk to the creators of independent entertainment. I'm Jason Godby, and with me in the Rabbit Hole studio today, she is the head of education and outreach for Seed and Spark. Welcome back to the the podcast, Miss Christina Rayo. Welcome, Christina. Thanks. Thanks for having me again. Well, thanks for coming again. I appreciate it, man. Uh, everybody, anybody uh, who schleps to Brooklyn, uh, <laughs> I always appreciate them coming down here. Uh, so before. We talked about you, and we talked about About a Donkey, which mm-hmm. is uh, your feature film, are currently available on VOD, right? Yep. Excellent. Uh, so now we want to talk more about kind of what you do for, for Seed and Spark. Great. Uh, which is a bit of a different function, because you're a filmmaker, but you're also a crowdfunding guru, and you also educate people about crowdfunding. Yeah. I started out as a user of the platform and then joined the team to help other filmmakers launch campaigns and get their film seen and made. Excellent. So before we kind of get into the nitty gritty of that and we start, you know, talking about what tips you have for people. So let's kind of just kind of define Seed and Spark because some people I think know about it, but I don't know if they know all of what Seed and Spark Mm -hmm. does. So uh, give us give us the skinny on Seed and Spark. Like tell us what they do and, and how they help filmmakers. Sure. Seed and Spark is a funding and streaming platform for film. We we definitely accept campaigns that are kind of film adjacent so anything to do with kind of storytelling visual storytelling uh, whether it's like film festivals or uh, film like uh, I guess websites or anything that is related to film but basically we're trying to kind of create true independence and sustainability for independent artists that are working in the film medium and so while we are mainly or at least started as a crowdfunding platform and that is what most of our user base is we're also a streaming platform because we want filmmakers to have a direct connection to their audience so that they could theoretically crowdfund through them and then distribute directly to them and kind of have this one-stop hub on our platform where you don't need to you know give up your IP and sort of deal with usually these like middle men of of filmmaking and especially distribution as a platform do you wind up putting a lot of people on the platform that have crowdfunded through you previously is it kind of like a, an all-in-one ecosystem type thing it is for i would say for features shorts not so okay. much because shorts tend to just release on you know vimeo and youtube and not really behind a paywall of any kind but we definitely have a lot of features that come full circle and we also acquire content and so you can submit on our site for free if you want to be considered for the streaming platform in terms of the stuff that uh, well we'll get into the streaming platform later but mm-hmm. let's talk about seed and spark as a crowdfunding platform yeah okay so um i have a film i want to get an, i want to get on seed and spark to start crowdfunding what's the process like for me like what do, what are the how do I start? Where do you come into the picture? Like, how does it work? So we're the only platform that promises every single campaign feedback, personalized feedback. So basically, you go to our website, go to the crowdfund page of seedandspark.com, and you can start filling in the submission form, which you can do sort of at your own leisure. So you fill it in a little at a time or immediately and just submit for review. You can submit as a work in progress as long as each field is filled out to some degree. And once you do that within two two business days, you hear from a crowdfunding specialist and they will look at your pitch video. They'll look at, you know, your goal amount, your synopsis, just sort of your materials that you're marketing with and give feedback on how to improve, you know, what you could do better. How would how would you best market to who your audience is? And we kind of run some things by you, like, you know, tell us your numbers of your email list and your social media following. And when are you looking to go live? And it is kind of like a full immersive experience with someone who's just really focused on your campaign and your success to get you going so how many folks do you have over there like it sounds <laughs> like there's like a good side because uh usually you know with a, a platform um like when indiegogo was doing more film i had john Tregonis on the show mm-hmm. a while back and he was kind of the guy for film there mm-hmm. and it was maybe him and another guy that did it and that was sure. basically it so do you guys have you have enough people that you can work with filmmakers individually. Yeah, well, so we are a small team. It's really only three people doing okay. feedback. But because we have this personalized approach, we have people that are just focused on feedback. They don't really do anything else within the company. Um, and so that's how we make it work. But yeah, we have we have the highest success rate, 80%, um, compared to any other platform that's twice as much as any other platform. And so it's because we give this personalized feedback. In the process, um, 
wh- how long do campaigns typically last? Is it like a one month, two month, three month th- type of thing? The most common is 30 days. 30 days. You can do 30, 45, or 60. Okay. I don't recommend 60. You know, it is, it's a long time to maintain that kind of activity for both you and your audience. Right, uh, because 60 days is forever. And because mm-hmm. I, I think one of the things, if you've never crowdfunded, um, and I have, I have not done it yet. Mm-hmm. I've, I've interviewed lots of people okay. who have crowdfunded. And, but if you haven't crowdfunded, it's like a full-time job, basically. It is, uh, yeah. When you, so when you're doing it, it's a, it's a marathon until you get to the finish line. And there's a number of things that people should do. In terms of that, so if you're working with uh, somebody, if you're working with you guys for 30 days, is it like a Kickstarter where, or I can't remember which one it was, but uh, if you don't, if you don't achieve your goal, you don't get them. Like, how does that work kind of thing? So we're kind of a happy medium. We're not flexible, which is most platforms out there. And we're not all or nothing, which is Kickstarter's model. We're an 80% threshold. You have to get to 80% to receive your funds because we believe that any truly resourceful filmmaker can make the film they've promised on 80% of their goal. But anything less than that is kind of sacrificing something they've promised. And so we really want, you know, we want filmmakers to succeed we want them to be able to do this again and again like I've personally crowdfunded four times Um, and so accountability is a big factor there so you want to make sure that you raise enough to deliver on whatever it is you're promising the audience Um, and 80% seems to be that that sweet spot and what's also really cool is that it doesn't just factor in money we're the only platform that accepts loans so um, you have to itemize your goal you break it down into what you're spending money on and if anyone has like the location you need they can offer that to you if they have any gear that you need and they're local and they want to loan it to you for the you know maybe a few days on set or the entire production um, they could donate like props or wardrobe things like that and the value of what those costs would be go towards the overall value of your goal so when you say loan you don't mean like bank loan yeah no no okay you mean mean like like in kind or like vinnie bag of donuts loan from you know the loan shark uh, of the neighborhood okay so i got you you kickstarter indiegogo is not really doing film anymore Mm -hmm. i don't know how many other f- crowdfunding platforms there are now. Yeah. And the last time I talked about this with when I had John Tricconis on the show, that was like a year ago. Mm-hmm. And I know the speed of the internet and things mm-hmm. change. So one of the things I kind of wanted to ask you, something I asked him a year ago, what is like the state of crowdfunding right now? Are there more people trying to do it? Are people being more successful? Are they being less successful? Is And, you know, kind of like where's the money coming from? Are you finding that you're getting... Uh, you know, more money from fewer donors or uh, less money from more donors. Um, I'll break that down, but like just kind of give us a state of the union in terms of where it's at. Like, and you know, how vile you've done it four times, Mm -hmm. but you're like a freaking juggernaut of (laughs) crowdfunding and you do this for a living. Not everybody does. So like what's credible and viable for you is probably not you know, I don't know if it's if it's for the average filmmaker kind of thing. I mean, I, I my first three campaigns were before I started working actually in crowdfunding, and so I think that it is viable. I would say that there was a big boom probably around 2014 where everyone was just launching campaigns, and and I would say that success rates were probably falling because it was now something that was on everyone's radar, but they didn't. A lot of people were just launching and expecting. Those are oversaturated. In yeah, words. and yeah. it was like you know people just felt like oh if you build it they will come like you just put it up and people decide to give you money and then I think people started to realize that that's so not the case. It is so much work, and now we're seeing. I mean, our success rate has increased, and so and I we haven't seen a decline in uh, campaign like the number of campaigns. We've seen a decline in the maybe the goals of individual campaigns. Maybe they're li- raising less money because they're thinking more realistically about what their audience can pull in. So there's a more like that's an important thing too. Like you're going to be more successful if you're not trying to raise millions. Like if you're yeah. if you have a reasonable goal and. And doing the research beforehand, which we'll get into a minute mm-hmm. about like tips and things like that. But yeah, you could you could be more successful just. And I'm trying to think empirically here, like just from a, a journalistic standpoint of, Seed and Spark might be more successful because you'll have less competition. You know, if there if Indiegogo isn't around, that's a third of the companies that used to do it that's not there. Also, you might be more successful too because of the amount of attention that you're able to give filmmakers, yeah. which not a lot of platforms are, mm-hmm. quite frankly. When somebody comes to you with a project, mm-hmm. and you do you ever kind of say, 
I think your goal is under unrealistic based on your network kind of thing. We do, yeah. Okay. That's a huge part of the feedback process. How does that conversation go usually? <laughs> it, it varies. I mean, some people don't want to hear it. Um, generally, we, if it's extremely unrealistic, we may not launch them just because it would... Set up for failure. Yeah, exactly. And, and we want, you know, I would say the other platforms are great, but they're not so focused on what we are, which is really trying to maintain crowdfunding as a way for filmmakers to get content made. And that means it needs to succeed and it needs to be done properly and it needs to deliver. And so we really want to make sure that filmmakers are launching responsibly and realistically. Um, And also just like finding some sort of achievement within even these smaller dollar amounts. So if you lower your goal, what percentage of your production would that achieve and how can you communicate that to your audience so that they know what to expect out of this like $10,000 campaign if your entire budget is actually like 100 or 150,000, you know? Right. And um, do they need more than one campaign? Right. And so these are things we talk to them about and for right. the most part because we are experts and we have the success rate and Part of my job is teaching. We offer a free crowdfunding workshop that we teach across the country. Um, that that sort of gets people to eventually, you know, work with us and lower their goals and, and really take that feedback in. Yeah, I, I think that's a big part of it. Is you know, when you start out, like not only like a realistic budget of what you're going to make, mm-hmm. but a realistic picture of what you can raise given your personal resources, because a lot of it is going to do with correct me if I'm wrong, but a lot of it is going to do with your own personal network, the people you know, the people who are involved, and the people they know, so that you can get maybe that you know third or 30% uh, yeah. up front kind of thing. Um, but in terms of the State of the Union, so to speak, do you find that people are getting funded from uh, a, a, a larger array of, of donors and who are giving smaller amounts? Or do you feel like there are still those, what do they call them, like super donors who are giving people uh, large amounts kind of thing? There are some super donors, or I mean, I contributors, I prefer that word. I think it's, you know, you're sort of contributing to the creation of something. A super donor sounds like somebody's going to give them a kidney <laughs> or something. Right, right. Just because like donation implies a handout and I think that you really want to remember that you are offering something to your audience Um, and so they're contributing to that to the creation of something and the participation of something Uh, but I would say for the most part it is a lot of people giving smaller amounts and so you really do want to think about your reach before you launch like how many people do you currently have access to and what could that turn into And and I really like to think of crowdfunding as like making a film where your production is kind of won or lost in the pre-production stage, so is crowdfunding. It's really about the prep that you do and especially about the audience building you do before you go live. And as far as the stuff that's getting funded, like is there, well, I, I would say in terms of like, are people more likely to, and uh, you know, I don't want to, I don't want to like pick on short films, mm-hmm. but are they less likely to get funded? Are they more or less likely to get, if you have a short, for instance, let me rephrase this. If you have a short, are you more likely to get funded because you don't need as much money to make it, or are more people like are there more uh, contributors that want to invest in something like a uh, feature film because mm-hmm. that's going to give them more no- notoriety and get distribution or at least have you know a better chance at festivals or whatever? Like, is there is it kind of fifty fifty or do you feel like there's being a push more now towards bigger projects? Because we have digital technology and we can make bigger, bigger things. With, like, because you made a you made a a, a a feature film for like two bucks. Uh, you know, you made it for <laughs> yeah. like, what did you make it for like twelve grand? Uh, my first feature was yeah, it was it was about a fifteen grand. Fifteen feature. grand feature. So um, yeah. so you know, are you more likely to get that funded rather than you know your six thousand dollars short film or something like that? So it varies. We we see the same success rates across different uh, formats, but I, def- I definitely see a difference in goal sizes for sure. And so like if you're making a very, very expensive short, you will probably have a harder time raising all those funds because I think, you know, you, you're being compared to other shorts o- that have much lower goals. And from an audience perspective, it's like, why do you need so much more to make something that's the same runtime, you know, maybe. Um, And and then again, it's like thinking about who you're targeting. You're not targeting other filmmakers who understand how much a film costs. You're you're hopefully targeting, you know, your viewership, your audience members. And so they have to really understand why you need all that money. And so it can be easier in that sense for a feature. 
um, especially because they understand they're getting like from their mind a full film out of it. Uh, that said, I would say shorts do really well because usually it's like the first time a filmmaker is asking for money um and people <laughs> so like, the, the, it's still it's still fresh unplowed in, so, in some sense, <laughs> undriven yeah. snow that like, they can get to i can say that my first short was was successful crowdfunding because it was the first time i asked for money um and then the next time i crowdfunded i had thankfully built an audience out of that short and so i had a new pool of people to be tapping um and so that that can work in your favor if you know if you're crowdfunding again but yeah it varies i would say it's really about the 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 size of the goal than about the format itself and you bring up a really good point is like you're not crowdfunding to filmmakers Mm -hmm. you're crowdfunding to uh who people who you want to see whatever you you know whatever you're making and i think part of it this will uh brilliantly segue into my next bit because um what you were just talking about is sort of educating the audience Mm -hmm. uh as to you know where this money is going and what it's for and why you need so much of it Mm -hmm. because film is expensive but uh i would say um now there's a lot of education about this out there now there's there's youtube videos there's books and stuff like that what is still what are people still not getting like what is what is the what is the uh, territory that people still need to be educated on, or what? What like what do you find when people approach you, like say the first timers out there? Mm-hmm. What don't they know that they should know? I would say that most of the books and the you know the how tos out there are focused on the execution, like how to reach out to people and what you should be saying and sort of the action items of the campaign itself. What is lacking is the who, like who are you actually targeting and that it's not the same for every project. I think filmmakers come in not knowing who their audience is and and how to find them. And so that's something that we really try in my in my role as education um, and in the workshops we do. We try to get filmmakers to think about who their audience is. And that means like getting comfortable pitching and getting reactions to that pitch and then asking specific information questions to get specific information about the people who are interested in that so that you can find ways to you know identify who your audience is and how to reach them and how to speak to them and Mm -hmm. how to get them to become amplifiers for you and in terms of that like how do you do that like how what are the what are the because you know i've pitched stuff and Mm -hmm. um you know my first thing is like okay i know why i want to see this or Mm -hmm. i know why i want to make it Sometimes I'm like, yeah, does anyone want to see this thing? Like, how do I how do I get it so that um, I you know this is a this is the type of material that I go you know what this is right for an audience and, and a lot of times I think you kind of have to beta test it yeah you kind of put it out there and you know I like to talk to civilians mm-hmm. you know people yep. who aren't in this business yep. because talking to a filmmaker or talking to you know another content creator a totally different ball game than talking to like like a real person mm-hmm. <laughs> who yeah, you yeah. know who just watches movies and doesn't make them um is, is there any kind of uh, proven method for that that you've seen that where people have been able to like i don't know, either reach out to people on social media or talk to friends or like what do people do in terms of like how do you find your audience kind of thing so an exercise i like to do is get someone in a room you know if i'm teaching one of my workshops and i'll say someone in here please pitch something they're working on and especially if they don't know who the audience for it is and then someone it takes maybe a while for someone to actually raise their hand and and agree to pitch that's intimidating Um, yeah but i think it you know it's important as filmmakers we have to get comfortable you know talking about what we're working on and so when someone eventually does then i'll ask the room you know to someone to raise their hand if they would truly watch that and that's a key factor is like getting comfortable asking people and that doesn't sound terrifying or anything <laughs> right <laughs> i think you have to be comfortable hearing no maybe, part of the job you know? man um but what you know it, it gives you a strategy you know you don't want to go in and make something and then not ha- know how to get it seen you know and so because filmmaking is so much work and to do all of that to spend that kind of money and then not know what to do with it after i think is the worst thing and so eventually if you can get someone to say yes and Yes, hopefully they're not filmmakers themselves. Um, And so, like, for me, for instance, I have a local barista. She knows I'm a filmmaker. She asks me what I'm working (laughs) on all the time. 
perfect person to test out. Oh my god, that is so awesome! Pitch your barista. Yeah, yeah. I mean, pitch your barista, pitch your bartender. That's awesome. I'm gonna embroider that on a pillow. That's amazing. (laughs) Um, But then you want to collect information. So, like, you know, what social media platforms do you use? What kind of blogs do you read? Where do you hang out online? What are your hobbies offline? Little things that give you details about the type of person that wants to watch your thing and find out why that intrigues them. Like, what is it about my pitch that you liked? So that you then have ways of reaching out to people and saying, hey, you know, you like this kind of stuff or you care about this or, you know, you are craving this from your content and making your film like an offer to them. Is there a difference between, and I'm, I'm splitting hairs here, but is there a difference between the audience that you pitch that would want to contribute to your campaign and just your run-of-the-mill audience member who would want to watch your movie. Because in this instance, when you're trying to crowdfund, you're looking for the former, Mm -hmm. really. I mean, of course you want the latter Mm because you want people to see your thing, but you're really looking for someone who's, you know, more than I'll click on that, more than I'll share that, or I'll like it, or whatever, I'll buy that. Mm -hmm. And is there a difference between those two people, and how do you find the people who are serious enough that would say, who believe in the idea, that Mm -hmm. want to give money to it. I would say there is a difference, though, as you said, you definitely want to reach just the viewers, especially because they will, you know, when the film's done, be there waiting to watch it. And they could also be the people who spread the word to reach those real contributors during a campaign. So you do want to target them both. Um, I would say that the why is the biggest thing, like finding out when you pitch to people, you know, are you just like, oh, that sounds cool, I would watch it, or are you excited about it? And if they're excited about it, you know, find out why. As I said, it all comes down to your why, and you should personally have a why for wh- why you want to tell this story, but also have a reason for why a it should A why other made. than, I think this will make money. Right, yeah. yes. A passionate, you know, personal why. But then also, like, why it matters against all the other things that are coming. Why would anyone want to see this movie? Yeah, yeah. And, and be able to articulate that. That's a huge thing. And, and as I said, it's about reaching out to people in a very personalized way and saying, hey, here's a why, you know, here's your why, here's why you should care about this thing that I'm making. And hopefully your why will match their thing. Like, and you spoke about this on our first episode when you mm-hmm. talked about, you know, uh, is, is it an issue that they have? Is mm-hmm. it a location that they're familiar with? Do they want to see a movie made on Long Island with a donkey? Right. You know, for instance. A type of representation. That type of, re- yeah. Like, is, is, it a, is it a woman's movie? Is it about Black Lives Matter? Is it, you know, right. does it have a, a, a heart to it? That's Is it trying to say something? something kind mm-hmm. of thing um, because you know if you tried to crowdfund um, you know if you if you tried to crowdfund a movie that you don't believe in or that you don't feel like other people will believe in you'll have a really hard time trying yeah. to get that thing made so we're going to move on from that a little bit but I think that's all good stuff and I, I think uh, people that's what they forget about the most is they 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 you know and I always tell people like I was talking to another creator and she wanted to make a show and she's trying to figure out the best way to do it and I was like well you know uh, why show is the first question you know why do you want to make this thing why does anybody need to see this thing why does anybody care and then you can worry about what form it should take and you know how you're going to actually make it but if you if you start with why then um, it'll solve a lot of your problems kind of thing and that's really where like you were saying like that's where the heart of the pitch comes from yep yeah. So moving on from that, and so I just want to talk a little bit more about Seed and Spark as a platform mm-hmm. at where people put stuff. Yeah. So um, give me like what, what typically um, what typical what's typical of a project that would get on a Seed and Spark as opposed to you know. Uh, another type of platform like what do you guys look for in particular do, is there a mandate of stuff that you look for there there is uh, so basically we care about kind of underrepresented voices and untold stories and so the kind of content that maybe isn't getting a home on mainstream platforms because they're considered like too specific to a specific kind of audience and and we like that because we basically we want you to be able to see the world on Seed and Spark so different voices different identities um, intersectional identities for sure so generally if you are kind of challenging the status quo of representation either behind the scenes or in front of the camera or in terms of the story that's being told we're interested Uh, that said we do like to keep we don't want to just have like an endless library of content and so you know if we have a documentary that's about a specific you know like a group in a part of the world maybe 
and another one of that comes along, we probably wouldn't take both. You know, like we want to have a very curated field to the platform. So it's like, oh, you're interested in this kind of topic. Here's the title to watch. Right. You're not going to be it's not like History Channel. We can just all be about Nazis. <laughs> right. <laughs> you can have World War Two documentaries at the yin yang. OK. My other question, I think I asked you this when we when we uh, talked in front of people when we, when we did the, uh, the seminar. But mm-hmm. like so say you're and I'm just spitballing here. You're a, like a white cis male. Mm-hmm. Maybe you're middle aged from New York, uh-huh. and you want a project that you want to develop on us you know, and get it to like a seed and spark because mm-hmm. you like that audience. What would you know if if someone like me wanted to make a video or, or put a, 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 a project up there? What would it kind of have to be in order to like? Would I be disqualified automatically because I no. look the way I look, no. or because I'm male and all that? Like how no. how does like what what could you do that would be um, acceptable kind of thing? Yeah, so we like to think, you know, we like to say inclusion is for everyone. And so for one thing, there are a variety of ways that you can be underrepresented. And a big factor is definitely class, you know, and so that has nothing to do with sort of what you look like um, or who you love. Uh, But so that's one thing. And then really it's about your hiring practices. And so even if you're the one telling the story, who are you employing above the line that maybe isn't getting opportunities and how are they inclusive and and how can they meet that requirement? And so we really just want to see our creators committing to inclusion and diversity and, and not sort of being homogenous. For those who want to know more about you or more about Seed and Spark, where can they find you on the web? Uh, SeedandSpark.com. We're also at Seed and Spark on social media. Um, you can go to ChristinaRaya.com to find out more about me, and that links to all of my projects and my social. Great. And, you know, thank you for coming, and thank you so much for taking this trip down the rabbit hole. For more of this show, you can visit our website, NoRestOfTheWeekendPodcast.com. You can also find us on all the, if you're an audiophile, you can also find us on all the audio channels, uh, uh, Anchor, Apple Podcasts, Stitcher, Google Play, Spotify, et cetera, et cetera. And uh, once again, I just want to thank my guest, Christina Rea. Thanks for stopping by Thanks. again <laughs> two times on the show. Uh, if you have any other projects, feel free to you know ring me up and come back. And uh, for Behind the Robert Productions, I'm Jason Godby. Thanks for joining us. We'll see you next time. <laughs> <laughs>